From TV8 in Cleveland, this is News Center 8 with Jeff Maynard, Tim Taylor, Jan Jones for vacationing Dick Goddard, and Fred McLeod for Jim Mueller. A quick roll call at the top. Jim has the day off. Dick is winding up a week's vacation. Jim Mueller is with the Browns in Green Bay. Northeast coastal areas of Mexico were not the place to be today as Hurricane Anita moved inland, packing incredible winds of up to 186 miles an hour. Thousands of Mexicans evacuated fishing villages along the coast, but it's a real blessing that when Anita hit land, she moved in over an area that's mostly woodland and only thinly populated. You're seeing some of the effects of the hurricane, but as of our airtime tonight, we've received no reports of any casualties in the storm. Closer to home, a northeast Ohio city is a potential hot spot tonight. Tim has that. Jeff, thank goodness there have been only a few minor fires in Ashtabula since yesterday morning when 36 Ashtabula firemen walked off their jobs. The firefighters had worked without a contract since the first of the year, but now the men say the city has reneged on a binding arbitration clause in a contract the city claims is invalid. But as you might expect, the real crunch is over money. We work 56 hours a week. Every other uh, public employee works 40, and we would like to get a little bit closer together. City Council wants us to pay for that uh, with less wages than the other employees. We don't feel that that's acceptable at this time. But there is some positive news coming out of Ashtabula tonight. We've now gotten word that the firefighters rank and file are hearing details of a new offer from the city. No word yet on the results of that meeting. Cleveland firemen and the families they protect are breathing a bit easier these days. The rash of arson fires on the city's near west side seem to have ended with the indictments of half a dozen people, including three today. The trio includes a 66-year-old woman. They were linked to a scheme to defraud insurance companies by setting fire to various houses. And former County Sheriff Ralph Krieger was in the middle of other court action today that could cost him $75,000. Krieger was successfully sued in common pleas court today by the estate of a former prisoner, Bobby Lee Hicks. The man burned to death in his county jail isolation cell six years ago after getting his hands on cigarettes and matches. Now that suit charged Krieger with negligence and the former sheriff is expected to appeal. A while back, we did a story on one of the most dangerous jobs in town, working the road gangs on the shoreway with traffic flying by at up to 80 illegal miles an hour. Being out here is dangerous enough in broad daylight, but at nighttime, with drunks and crazies on the road, it's almost kamikaze duty. Last night, a car went out of control, crashed into some barrels, and seriously injured a workman. News Center's Ed Bates, though, found a surprise. We went out to check on the road work tonight. Ed? Jeff, when we came out here, we were expecting to find road crews, but with the heavy holiday traffic that's expected over Labor Day, we found out that all the road work, where they could possibly move the equipment off and get the barrels off the highway, it has been removed. You'll still have places like where I'm at right now, just past 55th Street, where they can't fix a hole because it involves a bridge or something like that. But wherever possible, all the equipment, all the barrels and that have been taken off to make it a lot easier for people to drive on this Labor Day weekend. This is one of the most dangerous weekends we have every year. About 570 people are expected to die according to the National Safety Council. But you'll have a chance for a break. News Center's Kathy Adams has that story. If you're traveling this holiday weekend, we have some good news for you. The price of gas is down. A national survey by the American Automobile Association shows that regular gasoline is down almost a penny for this Labor Day weekend. This reporter checked with area service stations and found that gas here and across the country is averaging 63.7 cents per gallon. If you're traveling to the southwestern states, gasoline is selling for 60.8 cents a gallon, which is about the lowest you'll find in the country. Go west and prices for Petro are at least six cents more. AAA surveyed more than 4,000 service stations in the U.S. They reassure us that most stations will be open and gas plentiful. Okay. Kathy Adams on the road for News Center 8. Off, legal action is a definite possibility in the tragic death of that premature baby girl at Metro General Hospital earlier this week. News Center 8's Mike Cragen takes a look now at what the county prosecutor might be looking at. Neither Metro General nor the City Utilities Department will say directly the other is at fault in the baby's death. Hospital spokesmen do say they think the city was wrong not to warn them that work was going on in the area, that sediment could clog the hospital water system, causing life support equipment to break down. 
Utilities Director Raymond Kadukas, in defense of his people, suggests that perhaps the life support equipment in the hospital nursery is not up to par. Flimsy is the word he used. If you have two compressors with uh, filters equipped to take out sediment, and if uh, the equipment is designed to remove sediment, and, and it doesn't do that, then, you know, there's a possibility that there may have been something wrong. And, uh, I simply cannot believe that it was the fault of the equipment. I think any equipment that uh, is water-cooled or that runs on water is designed to work on reasonably clean water. And with the amount of deposits that we've pulled out of the line, I don't think it's a reasonable expectation that any equipment could work on that, on that kind of water. Both the hospital and the utilities department say lawsuits are possible in the baby's death. Legal action beyond that, criminal proceedings specifically, is not likely. Doctors at Metro General say that they can ever say with certainty that sediment clogging the life support equipment caused the baby's death. The baby was already in critical condition. It was extremely premature. Its chances of survival very slight. It's doubtful any investigation will show conclusively the baby would have lived if. Mike Cragen, News Center 8 at Metro General. Senator Hubert Humphrey left a Minneapolis hospital today knowing full well that he may only have months to live. And it hurts to see this great man that we're accustomed to seeing so bubbling with life, now so obviously in declining health. How do you feel, sir? Well, how was the weather today? So I feel That's the way I feel. Right. I think <laughs> I, the weather and Hubert <laughs> Humphrey got together. I feel, I feel very much better. Senator Humphrey will rest at home a while, then he'll return to work in Washington. If your worrying has led to ulcers and you're now worrying that you'll need some surgery, we've got a report that might calm you down some. Steve Gendel has an encouraging report. The drug is sold under the name Tagamet, and in a word, it stops stomach acid. Excess acid is what eats away at the lining of the stomach and intestine to cause an irritation we call an ulcer. Tagamet stops secretion, manufacture of the acid, allowing the ulcer to heal. Tagamet is an antihistamine like allergy medications, but it doesn't stop a running nose or itching eyes. It works on the so-called histamine 2 effect, which controls stomach secretions. Dr. Dennis McCarthy was in charge of clinical research on the drug at NIH. This is a tremendously effective drug. It heals 85% of the ulcers, and it may help to deal with the complication of ulcers, such as perforation and hemorrhage. And it is possible to use the drug in ulcer patients that are too ill to even be considered for surgery. So there's no question this drug is a revolution in healing the ulcers. There's still much research to be done on the drug. For one thing, doctors don't know what happens when a patient stops taking the medication. Steve Gendel at the National Institutes of Health. Pennsylvania quit their jobs, sold their cars and a lot more, and went to work full-time trying to win the Pennsylvania State Lottery's top prize of $1,000 a week for life. They didn't get a winner in their first $9,000 worth of tickets, and now with the contest due to end next Tuesday, they're blowing their last $3,000, figuring by now the odds are with them. This weekend, they are spending day and night at a local restaurant, trying to scrape and check all those tickets in a marathon, round-the-clock session. They have found 600 tickets they believe qualify for the drawings, leading to the $1,000 a week drawing next month. And they've got quite a stake in it all, thanks to the thousands they've spent on tickets. We had a car, a huge desk in the dining room. We sold clothing, shoes, purses, pictures on the wall, a stereo. Can you think of anything else, Tom? Oh, we had, we had at least four garage sales. We sold just about everything that wasn't tacked down and absolutely necessary. Sure, it's a long shot, the Drakes admit, but they accept that and think it's worth taking the chance. After all, Rocky, in the movie, was a long shot, wasn't he? Charles Osgood, CBS News, McMurray, Pennsylvania. The people of Greater Cleveland are all big winners again this year with the 49th Cleveland National Air Show. It's billed as the biggest air show in the country. Burke Lakefront Airport will be jammed with folks wanting to get a good close-up look at more than 200 planes and booths, not to mention the thrill-packed shows and demonstrations. This evening, the spectacular Air Force Thunderbirds practice their precision maneuvers. That'll include hitting supersonic speeds. And of course, there's many other exciting planes and pilots in the air show, along with rare aircraft. Show hours are 10 to 5, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, with aerial shows beginning at 2 each day. 
And Jan, I know you've got some good weather for the air show. I you know, hope Tim, you do anyway. I did a little story from the air show at noon on the noon news today, and I have to admit I was standing in the raindrops. And uh, we looked at the sky out over Lake Erie. It was starting to clear already. We ended up with a beautiful day, and I'd like to tell you that tomorrow, too, will be sunny and cool, a perfect day to come down to Burke. I'll tell you more about it after this message. We are in a blood emergency, by the way, here in Cleveland. You've heard a lot about it all week long. Tomorrow's going to be a big day, however. You're going to have great weather to get out there and perhaps donate the gift of life, blood, to in several suburban areas, by the way. And if you'd like to know where they will be out in Shaker and Parma and so forth, Rocky River also, please call the Red Cross so that you'll know where and what times to be donating blood tomorrow. Let's look at the national map right away, where we can see that Anita indeed is inland, is in the country of Mexico. Now, as far as we're concerned up here, a bright band of cloud cover stretching all the way through the uh, lower Great Lakes area. Now that cloud cover is connected with a cold front that has slowly been pushing through the state of Ohio. In fact, it has touched off a good deal of uh, thunderstorms. Let's look at the national map. Right here is the cold front I'm talking about. Right now it's about ce oh, centrally located through the state of Ohio. And as far as these thunderstorms are concerned, earlier we talked about Toledo and Buffalo. Then about 8, 39 o'clock we had thunderstorms indicated in the Youngstown, Canton, Akron area. Now they are slowly moving east. We do have some rain still in the extreme northeastern corner. This low pressure system, by the way, too, will be bringing cool winds out of Canada, which means that tomorrow not only will we have clear skies and dry air, but the temperatures will be um, much cooler. So I think it's going to be a whole lot more pleasant than it has been for a lot of you. 111, the nation's high at Gila Bend, Arizona, and 37 was the nation's low, that at Butte, Montana. Now our low here in the state of Ohio was Youngstown with 83, Cincinnati was the hot spot, 93 degrees. On the state of Ohio map, as you can see, a lot of cloud cover. And here, these thunderstorms, again, indicated in the Akron, Canton, Youngstown area, slowly moving east. Still a little bit of drizzle up there in the northeastern counties, 85 and 70. Today's statistics here in Cleveland, 72 degrees at Hopkins here on the lakefront. The temperature is 77 degrees with 79% humidity. And our pollen count hit an all-time record high for Cleveland today, 1,320 as opposed to 136, which is the average for this date. Tonight, thunderstorms are likely yet, particularly in that northeastern corner, with a low of 63, Saturday, sunny and cooler, a high of 78 degrees. And for your entertainment, after the news, Houlihan and Big Chuck give you Kuru Ku, the beast of the Amazon. And I give you Jeff Maynard, the gentle beast of our newsroom. Ah, shucks. In case you're wondering, as I was, we found out that Hurricane Anita was not named for singer crusader Anita Bryant. The National Weather Service says this year's hurricane names were picked out about 10 years ago. But Miss Bryant does claim to know something about the weather. She once said that homosexuals were to blame for the California drought, that God was punishing the state because so many gay people live in California. The Veterans of Foreign Wars has awarded the late Elvis Presley its highest honor for patriotic and humanitarian service. The award says of Presley, his worthy example of honorable military service uh, and as a proven friend to his fellow man may be considered two of his greatest memorials. This picture will be a memorial to Leopoldo Aragon, who set himself on fire to protest the Panama Canal Treaty. Aragon died from his burns early today. 61-year-old actor Glenn Ford has taken out a license to marry actress Cynthia Hayward, 29. It will be his third, her second. Here in Cleveland, the Musicians' Union brightens summer days with free downtown concerts. Today they provided music for a free party for senior citizens of the Emanuel Care Center. Neil Zerker took a couple of unusual test rides today. First, he rode an M60 patent tank from Warrensville Heights to Burke Lakefront Airport. Neil, old soldier that he is, looks like he belongs up there, but he said it was a rough ride. But it turned out that was the easy way to go. Next, Neil raced a couple of other daredevils on elephants that are traveling with the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers Circus. Neil and his trusty Steve Big Pete won the race, but Neil told me winning wasn't as important as finishing and getting the heck down off here. And he said, all things considered, he would rather ride the tank. If that looks scary, I think it is. People who ride uh, elephants under normal conditions say it's scary being up there, and racing uh, is not normal conditions. <laughs> Tribe in action down at the stadium tonight. Fred, that's got to be part of the news tonight. Yeah, uh, judging back uh, Neil's ride, did he win a gold medal tonight? I don't think, I think he, he won he anything, an Olympic, but a, but a Olympic sword do. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. We've got golf, Jeff, to top the evening sports. We've got details when we come back.
Well, just two shots separate nine players after the opening round of the World Series of Golf in Akron. Tom Weisskopf, Hale Irwin, and Ray Floyd fashioned three under par 67s today. Weisskopf birdied the final two holes. Mark Hayes is all alone at 68, one shot behind. A group of five came in at 69. Gary Player, Jack Nicklaus, Graham Marsh, Lanny Watkins, and Spain's Seve Ballesteros. Ben Crenshaw and Jerry McGee are four more back with 71s. Tom Watson and Hubie Green are next at 72. Hollis Stacy made some golf headlines of her own today. The women's U.S. Open champ broke the course record in the Muscular Dystrophy Open in Springfield, Illinois. She fired a brilliant 7 under par 65 today to take a whopping 5-shot lead after 36 holes. Well, the Indians got some clutch hitting and pitching tonight to down the California Angels 3-1 to at the stadium. Paul Dade got the Tribe's first hit, a ringing double off the fence in right field off Paul Hartzell in the opening inning. He then came around to score when big Andre Thornton hit another rocket into the left field seats. The strong first baseman now has 27 round trippers and has driven in 60 runs, and you can bet he'll have his best year yet as a major leaguer. The Indians picked up an insurance tally in the eighth when Rick Manning came off the bench for this RBI single up the middle. It was his first hit since back on June the 8th. Jim Bibby won his 12th with help from Jim Kern and Pat Dobson. It was the 17th year save of the year rather for Kern. You know, it's been two and a half months since Frank Robinson was back here as a manager. I spoke with Robbie at length before tonight's game, and he told me if he gets another shot as a bench boss, he'll approach the job with the same attitude. I don't think your personality is going to ever change that much. And uh, after watching, uh, for, uh, doing it for two and a half years, uh, and uh, watching uh, now other people do it personally, uh, you know, I don't think it's any one solution, any one way of doing it. You just have to do it your way and hope that the ball players go out and uh, live up to their potential and capabilities. And uh, then you'll look like a good manager. If they don't, uh, then, you know, you have to go again because uh, the front office is going to fire the manager to, to try to quiet the fans. Quiet the fans. Some excellent matchups in the American League tonight. First off, the New York Yankees won again, blanking Minnesota 4 to nothing. Ron Guidry won his 12th of the year. Texas is leading Boston down in Arlington by a pair in the seventh, while Baltimore leads Chicago in the bottom of the ninth, 6 to 4. Detroit beat Oakland by that same count. Kansas City looks like they're going to sweep a pair from Milwaukee. They won the front game 3 to 1 as Hal McRae drove in two of those runs. And the Royals lead the night cap 3 to nothing in the eighth. Paul Splitorf lost a no hit bid in the eighth. Seattle beat Toronto this afternoon by a run. In the National League, Philadelphia blanked Cincinnati and Veterans Stadium. Bake McBride had all three RBIs. Jim Lonborg tossed a five-hitter. Houston is down Montreal by a 5-2 count. The New York Mets beat Atlanta in the first of a pair, 4 to nothing. Pat Zachary had a five-hitter. However, the Braves lead the nightcap by a run in the seventh. Pittsburgh is trailing Los Angeles out west in the second inning of play, 2 to nothing. St. Louis and San Francisco are early in that one. And Chicago trails San Diego, 1 to nothing, there in the fifth inning of play. The Jaybirds have won a very big ball game tonight in Cincinnati as they held off Milwaukee 11-10 in their first game of their best-of-three playoff series. Jack Gansheimer led the way with three runs and three runs batted, or three hits and three runs batted in. And because of the fences being 315 feet deep, only one home run was hit. The Jays will play Milwaukee again tomorrow afternoon. Two of the local teams did well in the ASA slow pitch tournament in Parma tonight. This afternoon, Hillcrest Tavern of Cleveland ripped Salt Lake City 10-2, and tonight Ohio Sealants of Parma whipped. Providence, Rhode Island, 14 to 2. However, Lakewood's Holy Name Society was defeated by Kansas City, 14 to 6. Defending national champion Warren Motors of Jacksonville, Florida, flexed their muscles tonight, downing Indianapolis with ease, 21 to 5. Well, most of the big guns passed their test today in the U.S. Open. However, one giant did fall, Ily Nastasi, at the top of your screen. Was surprised by Italy's Corrado Berezuti, 6-4, 6-4. Nastasi came into the tournament, seated seventh. Despite a sore shoulder, Bjorn Borg again won easily, blitzing John James, 7-5, 6-4. However, Bjorn's coach for the Nets, Marty Reeson, was eliminated by third-seeded Brian Gottfried in three sets. And on the distaff side, Billie Jean King had problems, but did manage to subdue Ann Smith of Dallas, 6-3, 3-6-7-5. Chris Everett and Sue Barker won handily. The college football season officially got underway tonight in New Jersey, and Joe Paterno's boys at Penn State are really laying it on Rutgers. 45 to nothing there in the fourth quarter. In NFL preseason plays, St. Louis down Chicago 23 to 14. The Steelers in a couple of Late touchdowns beat Philadelphia 21 to 13. Baltimore is leading the Lions by four in the third quarter. And for the third time in two days, the Buffalo Braves have swung a deal. John Gianelli has been sent to the Milwaukee Bucks for a number one draft pick in either 1979 or 1980. The Braves will get to make that choice, and they're going to be tough, Tim.
Okay, thanks, Fred. The 10th annual Oktoberfest officially got underway at the Berea Fairgrounds this evening with a wedding. The wedding of Don Miller and Tom Harrell. They followed in the footsteps of a prince and princess at the very first Oktoberfest in Munich 167 years ago. The couple invited 85 guests, but hundreds more attending the festival watched the ceremony. More than 300,000 people are expected during the four-day Oktoberfest, the most popular ethnic festival in this part of the country. The school board is trying to get eight old rundown school buildings ready to open for the first day of classes next Wednesday. The worst of the schools is Addison Junior High. Now, it'll probably pass health and safety checks, but at best, it's not going to be much of a place to go to school. Comment on how the courts and the school board got children into this mess in tonight's editorial from News and Public Affairs Director Virgil Dominic. The unfortunate events surrounding the failure of the Cleveland School Board's efforts to close eight schools may not turn into a total loss. If anything, it proves there's a lesson to be learned by both school officials and the court. The mix-up has shown there must be a closer working relationship among all parties involved, not just between the court-appointed experts and school lawyers, but also between Judge Frank Battisti and the elected Board of Education and school administrators. If there had been a more personal relationship, we can't believe the judge would have waited seven weeks to reject the requested school closings. The indecision not only created mass confusion for parents and children, it also will cost the already financially pinched schools as much as $2 million to prepare and keep the buildings open, and not one penny of that money will do anything to improve the quality of education. As we said, the unfortunate turn of events hopefully will bring on a better understanding between the court and school officials. If it doesn't, the desegregation process which lies ahead will be more difficult than it need be. That's our news at 11. Be sure to join Jim Finnerty and Kathy Adams for News Center 8's weekend news at 6 and 11. Have a safe and happy holiday. Have a nice weekend.